What's the word, math nerd? Let's learn about completeness. All right, let's just remember what infimums and supremums are. If I have a subset of the reals, the supremum, if it exists, is a number alpha, which is an upper bound of the set with the property that any smaller number is not an upper bound. And an infimum is a lower bound with the property that anything bigger is not a lower bound. Sometimes the supremum is called the least upper bound. It's an upper bound, but it's the smallest one. Nothing smaller than it is an upper bound. And similarly, the infimum is, told, is called the greatest lower bound. We left open the question of whether these things exist. If a set is bounded above, is there such a thing as the supremum? We did prove some results, like if the supremum exists, we can do certain things with them. But we left open the question, do the supremums even exist? So some sets we have shown to have supes and imps, but we did in fact notice that the supremum of a set, even if it exists, might not be in the set. Specifically, we dealt with these intervals. If you have an interval from A to B, a and B are the infimum and supremum, whether or not they belong to the interval. So sometimes they exist. We've left open the question of whether they always do, but even if they exist, they might not be elements of the set. They might just be other numbers. Now, if you are taking an intuitive approach to the real numbers, you just declare as an axiom the completeness axiom, which says as follows. If a set is bounded above, it has a real number, which is a supremum. The supremum of a set, if it's bounded above, exists. This is the completeness axiom. If a set has an upper bound, it has a least upper bound. Which means, yes, soups exist for the unsatisfying reason that we declare that they must. But what we're really doing is we're giving the real numbers a very important property called completeness. And it will have lots and lots of uh, consequences that we'll see later on that we really like to work with. Now, the other approach to completeness is through dedicant cuts. If you went through the entire construction of defining the real numbers as dedicant cuts on the rationals, this is a theorem that you can prove. Any set of dedicant cuts of the rationals, which is bounded above, actually has a supremum, which is another dedicant cut of the rationals. So if the real numbers are all dedicant cuts of rationals, then you get completeness as a theorem. But as I've mentioned before, the formalism of working through dedicant cuts is very, very uncommon. Much more common is just to take the completeness axiom. A set which is bounded above has a supremum. So whether you did dedicant cuts or not doesn't really matter from this point forward. We're just gonna be thinking in terms of subsets of the reals and we now have this result, whether it be axiom or theorem, that if a set is bounded above, it has a supremum. So work through some problems. Now that we know any time a, a subset of the reals has an upper bound, it actually has a supremum. Also, we have some conventions of doing arithmetic with infinity. A real number plus infinity is infinity. A real number minus infinity is minus infinity. And infinity minus infinity is not defined. If you ever are working through something and you're like, what's infinity minus infinity? Not defined. However, infinity plus 10 is infinity and that's fine. So work through these sample problems here. Also pause, like, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Do all that stuff too. All right, let's keep going. Oh, yeah, and the fourth one, we've got that the supremum of A intersect B is less than or equal to the minimum of the two supremums. Could it be smaller? Yes. In problem five, you were supposed to construct an example where the supremum of the intersection was strictly smaller than either of the original supremums. Can you actually get equality? Uh, yeah, if A and B are the same set, then A intersect B is the same set, the supremum of A, the supremum of B are the same number, and you do get equality for silly reasons. Suppose A is unbounded above and B is unbounded below. We're gonna define the supremum of A to be plus infinity and the inf of B to be minus infinity. Uh, Gary thinks that seems pretty reasonable, okay. We also define the supremum of the empty set to be minus infinity and the infimum of the empty set to be positive infinity. Uh, and that seems less reasonable, but it will make certain later results very consistent. Yeah, we could just declare it. I mean, as long as we're just making this up as we go along, we can declare whatever we want and hope that it's consistent. 
And since we're talking about arithmetic with infinities, it's not really going to mess up any real valued stuff. But Delaney has an interesting point. Every real number is an upper bound of the empty set. Okay, back when you proved that the empty set was bounded above, you can prove that any number you want is an upper bound of the empty set. So remember that the supremum is supposed to be the smallest upper bound, but if every real number is an upper bound, there really isn't a smallest one. So you can declare the smallest of all the real numbers to be minus infinity. So that's where that convention kind of comes from. Since every real number is an upper bound of the empty set, the smallest one is, and use big air quotes, minus infinity, even though that's not really a real number. Similarly, every real number is a lower bound of the empty set. So the infimum or the greatest lower bound would be the biggest of all the real numbers, which doesn't really exist, but we just declare it to be plus infinity. Now here's a really important theorem. The natural numbers are unbounded above. Yeah, of course not, right? The natural numbers go on forever. They couldn't possibly be bounded above. But the set 1, 1 1.9, 1.99, 1.999, etc., there's infinitely many and they always get bigger, but it's always bounded above by 2. So just because a set has infinitely many elements in it doesn't mean it can't be bounded above. So we have to prove it. Now what's clear is that there can't be a natural number that's an upper bound of the natural numbers because you could always add one to it. Okay, so alpha, if it's natural, can't be an upper bound because it's never going to be bigger than alpha plus one. But maybe somehow through some weirdness, there's a real number, alpha, which is an upper bound of the naturals. So let's assume to the contrary that the natural numbers are bounded above. What do I know about sets that are bounded above? They have a supremum. That's the completeness axiom. So if the natural numbers have a supremum, let's call it alpha. What does that mean? Alpha is an upper bound, but anything smaller than alpha isn't. Specifically, alpha minus one is not. So since alpha minus one is not an upper bound of the naturals, there must be a natural number bigger than alpha minus one. But if I add one to that inequality, I get n plus one is bigger than alpha, which contradicts the fact that alpha was an upper bound on the naturals. So we were able to use this trick of adding one to natural numbers, but we had to bring in the possibility that maybe there's a real upper bound that isn't natural. And here's how we get through it, through the existence of supremums. Okay, if the natural numbers have a supremum, then alpha is an upper bound, alpha minus one isn't. So you'd have to fit a natural number in between alpha and alpha minus one, which would then really start to mess up when you start adding one to that natural number over and over again. So work through the following problems uh, using, if you want, the previous fact that the natural numbers are not bounded above. Hint, number two is pretty easy if you've done number one. Okay, so this is all pretty intuitive stuff. The integers, the rationals are not bounded above or below. Also, for any real number, I can stick it in between two integers. Great. Now here is something we mentioned before, that the empty set and the real numbers themselves are both open and closed. It seemed weird that you could have a set be both open and closed, and in fact, as long as we're only talking about the real numbers, the only subsets of the real numbers that are both open and closed are the empty set and the entire real number line. So suppose you have a set which is both open and closed. Maybe it's empty, that's fine, that fits within our theorem, so suppose it isn't. It's both open and closed, but it has a point in it. It's not empty. We will show that if it contains at least one point, it must contain everything. So if you have a non-empty open and closed set, it must be all of the reals. Well, since A isn't empty, there's an X in it. Great. I'm going to define two things, F of X and G of X. So F of X is the supremum of Y's so that if I make the interval from X to Y, that's still a subset of A. And notice I'm not including Y in there. Similarly, G of X is the furthest I can move to the left and still be an element of a subset, sorry, of A. Now, since A is open, these are not empty sets, okay? Since we are in an open set, 
I can move somewhat to the right and still be an A, and I can move somewhat to the left and still be an uh, A. So these supremums and infimums exist. They might be plus or minus infinity. Okay. If these sets of possible intervals are bounded, then they will be real numbers. If they're unbounded, then they will be plus or minus infinity. Here is a picture of what we're doing. Okay, so my set A is open and closed, and X is an element of A. So let's put X here. Since X is in A and A is open, I can move to the right a little bit and still be in A. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define F of X to be, well, how far can I move to the right and still be a subset of A, and specifically, I want the supremum of all such Y's. And similarly, since A is open and X is in A, I can move a little bit to the left, but just how far to the left can I get? That's gonna be G of X, it's gonna be the infimum of all Z's, so that this interval is, sorry, that doesn't need a negative sign, so that this interval is still a subset of A. If I can keep going forever, this supremum is infinite, and if I can keep going forever to the left, this infimum is negative infinite, but maybe I run out of room. Notice since we're building intervals here, our goal is to show that A, in fact, is all real numbers. We want f of x to be infinity and g of x to be minus infinity, to, that we can move as far as we want to the right or left and still be an A. So f of x is how far to the right we can go without leaving A and g of x is how far we can go to the left, and f of x itself doesn't have to be in A. I'm leaving open the possibility that you might move far to the right and hit some sort of open endpoint, that's fine. So suppose, for example, that f of x is a finite number. That means that the interval from x to y is a subset of A, but if I tried to move any further, I'm not a subset of A we're now gonna get a contradiction based on the assumption that f of x was a finite number y. We left unclear whether this y is in A or not, but there's two possibilities, either it is or it isn't. If y is an element of A, then since A is open, I can keep going, and y wouldn't have been the supremum of how far I can go and still be in A. But it would look something like this, okay? So if, this is all the set A, and then I hit Y, and it's in A. Well, A was open, which means I need to be able to have a little bit of wiggle room to the left and right of any point, meaning I could have kept going. Y was not the furthest I could have gone to the right and remained a subset of A. But what if Y isn't in A? I didn't just assume A was open, I also assumed A was closed which means its complement is open. So if y isn't in A, I can do the same thing, but in the complement, and I never could have reached y to begin with. So here it would look something like this. y is not in A, but the complement of A is also open. So I can put a little bit of wiggle room around this point and still be in the complement of A meaning I never could have gotten all the way to Y while still being subsets of A. Either way, we get a contradiction. If Y is a finite number, this furthest to the right I can go and still be subsets of A, if that's finite, we get a contradiction, whether that endpoint is in A or not. Therefore, it can't be finite. And similarly, a finite value of G of X, uh, moving to the left, is also gonna give a contradiction. So. Since f of x must be not finite and g of x must be not finite, then f of x must be plus infinity and g of x must be minus infinity, from which I derive that in fact all real numbers belong to A. So the only non-empty set which is open and closed is in fact all real numbers. So being open and closed at the same time is possible, but it's very extreme. And in fact, putting both of those conditions on at once really restricts what the set can possibly be. But don't forget, it, a set doesn't have to be open or closed. It's totally feasible to have lots and lots of sets, in a sense most sets, that are neither open nor are they closed. 
Both being open and being closed are very specific definitions. Putting both of them on at once is very restrictive, either you're empty or you're everything. But a lot of sets are not going to be open and they're also not going to be closed. So that'll close that out. We've learned a little bit about completeness. All bounded sets have supremums and infimums. If it's bounded above, it's got a soup. Bounded below, got an inf. Thank you.